This story happened a really long time ago. And by a long time, I mean a really long time. I'm in my 70s now, and must have been just around 15 years old when this happened. I will never forget it though. I grew up in a small town that was visited by a circus once a year. It would be a three-day event on Friday. The circus would have a big parade that went right through the middle of town. Then they would have a performance that night. The following two days, there would be a sort of carnival on the circus grounds during the day, followed by various shows during night. I was personally very fond of the trapeze artist myself. My family lived in town, and our road was on the parade route, so when it was time for the parade to come through, we would all rush out and sit in the front yard to watch it pass by. It was a bright and sunny day this year, and the Grand Marshal heralded one of the best parades I'd ever seen. During the parade, one thing, even at my young age though, caught me off guard. Most of the circus acts marched together in the parade. The trapeze artists were all together, the animals were all together, the clowns were all together. All of the other groups were much the same way. I noticed, though, that towards the end of the parade, there seemed to be one straggler, a lone clown who seemed completely out of place. He was very entertaining, though, and I didn't have a fear of clowns like some other people do. No one seemed to notice or care that he was nowhere near the others. He would go up to spectators on the side of the street and spray some flower on his costume. To others, he would make all sorts of weird clown gestures with his hands. I'm not really sure what to call it other than clown gestures, really. When the clown got up to my yard, though, he stopped and looked at me for a long, uncomfortable moment. He smiled. It was creepy for some reason to see him smiling within his painted-on smile. He walked up to me and patted me on the head before taking his hand off. He then took his finger and ran it down the side of my face. Then he rushed off. It was quite weird, but I didn't really think about it too much. He was a clown, and sometimes clowns act weird. Later in the evening, my family and I went to the night show as well. I watched the clown portion of the show, and was relieved in a way that the weird clown was in there for a few moments. I had an inkling of an idea that maybe he wasn't actually part of the circus and had somehow interjected himself into the parade. I'm not sure why I thought that, but I had been a little worried up until I saw he was a part of the actual crew. The show was really great, honestly, and my family left and went home. When we were home and I was laying there in bed, something woke me up in the middle of the night. I really wasn't sure what it was at first. After I'd been awake for a few moments, though, I heard something sort of like a rock hitting my window. You know exactly the sound I'm talking about. I crawled out of bed and got up. I gazed out the window, only to see that no one or no thing was there. I thought it must have been my imagination, until I heard it once more. I went back quickly and looked out the window, fully expecting to see someone outside. But once again, no one was there. At this point, though, I was now fully awake. I was pretty thirsty as well, so I decided I was going to go downstairs and get myself a glass of water. I walked down and went into the kitchen and grabbed a drink. After taking my first gulp, I turned and walked back into the living room. I dropped my glass and screamed when I saw that clown looking in through the living room window, waving at me in the darkness. He blew me a kiss and stared for a moment before running off. My screaming, of course, woke my parents up, who rushed downstairs. I explained to them what I saw. They didn't really do anything about it, though. I mean, sure, the clown was on our property, but they couldn't prove it. And even if we could, all he did was wave and blow a kiss at me. This was a much different time than nowadays. Clowns really didn't have the stigma they have nowadays, either. Regardless, it was a pretty creepy experience seeing that clown waving at me through my own living room window in the middle of the night. I remained inside the house until the circus left town a few days later. Have you ever heard of Camden Park? It's a really small amusement park in West Virginia. I grew up in that area. And at the time, Camden Park seemed like a really big deal to me. 
Since then, I've moved to Los Angeles, and when I moved there, I started going to Magic Mountain. Ever since then, Camden Park just seemed like a really small playground in comparison. Still though, my very first part-time job was at Camden Park. I was simply working in a food booth, but it was a pretty big thrill for me really. I got to hang out in the park for free when I wasn't working. Now, you might think that I wouldn't want to do that since I was already working there all day, but honestly, I really enjoyed it. One evening though, this happened. Sometimes, if the park had a particularly low attendance, they would allow the night operator of the Big Dipper roller coaster to continue to have the train cycle through the ride over and over without changing passengers. I was in the park this evening, and I was the beneficiary of several such cycles. The ride operator, Chet, was much older and a stereotypical carny type. He was one of those guys who always had some tobacco on his lip, even if he was drinking soda or something. He always smelled like he'd been drinking too, but definitely not soda. He was a nice enough guy though. He always made me feel a bit uneasy. He was one of those people who would trap you in a conversation, and if you were too nice, he wouldn't let you go. This happened to me quite often. My friends all made jokes that Chet must have the hots for me. I didn't really like those jokes much though. On this night though, when he finally stopped the train, he made it a point to come over and help me out of this. When he did this, his hand quote unquote slipped and rubbed against the front of my blouse. He apologized for it, but the smile on his face told me it was no accident, and the apology was not sincere. Work became a bit uncomfortable for the first time. Every time after that, Chet would be working nearly every day and would start coming over several times a day to talk to me. I'd stopped going to ride on the Big Dipper when he was there, simply because I didn't want to have to see him. He would ask me why I didn't come visit him, and I had to tell him I'd just been really busy. Even though I told him this, it never stopped him from coming to see me over and over every single day. On the days when he would get off around the same time I did, he would wait outside the park to walk me to my car. It started to get even weirder though. He would be waiting for me on days when he didn't even work. One night, when I was closing and going out to my car was one such night. Chet found me outside the park and started coming after me to my car. He was talking kindly and actually asked me out on a date. I explained to him that I was only 16 years old and obviously he was much older. Well, I won't tell anyone if you don't. I quickly declined and hopped into my car and left. And that was all I needed to hear to know that this was a bit worse than just a harmless crush. He insinuated he wanted to have sex with me as an underage girl, and that was really wrong. I only had a few more weeks before school started, so I talked to my parents. We agreed that I should just go ahead and quit that job. For a while afterwards, I actually didn't hear anything from Chet. To my surprise though, he actually showed up to my school's homecoming game that year and tried to sit down next to me. Luckily I was with friends and they were able to make him go away. He did also follow us out to the parking lot after. That was not the last time I saw him either. He began to hang out just off school grounds, and I'd see him many a time after school waiting for me. Late in the fall, I actually got a phone call from Chet. I was quite worried. I had no idea how he'd gotten my number. He began asking me why I'd quit working there, and asked me if I wanted to get together with him once again. I told him once again that I was underage, and he insisted that didn't matter. I told Chet to leave me alone. I would never date him, and I didn't want to talk to him ever again either. Of course, that didn't stop him. Chet would keep showing up everywhere. I assumed he must have also been watching me even when I wasn't aware, because the final time I ever saw him, he found me when I was alone. It was a day after school. I was walking to my car at night when Chet came around the side of another car just as I was getting into it. He ran up just as I slammed the door. He kept asking me to open it. I refused, telling him yet again to leave me alone. He was grabbing my mirror in his hand. He lifted his shirt up, and I saw he had a knife sheathed under his shirt. Chet saw the fear in my eyes when I saw his knife. He smiled at me and said, That's just Beth. She won't hurt you if you go out on a date with me. I freaked out at that point. I slammed the gas even though he was holding my mirror. 
I think I must have ran over his foot with my back tire, but I didn't really care. I rushed right home and told my parents everything. We called the police as well. I told them everything that happened too, and that I felt like he had been threatening me. The police apparently had a talk with him, and it must have worked because I never saw Chet following me around after. However, not seeing him didn't make my life any more comfortable. He always had a tendency to show up when I least expected it, and I'm sure he must have still been watching me even if I didn't see him. I never went to Camden Park again. I have no idea if he continued working there or left sometime after. When I turned 18, I went to college in Los Angeles, and since then, I much prefer Magic Mountain. I grew up in a rural community. Although I won't mention exactly where it was, we really didn't have much in the way of entertainment. It was a big deal when the county fair took place each year because of this. It was fun enough when I was a kid, but it was much more fun when I was a teenager, and I got to go there on my own. I wasn't particularly popular in school, and I was a bit of a loner as well. That's okay though, I like that. I was one of those guys who dressed all in black, had black hair, and didn't go out much. We didn't have designations such as goth back then, really, and I guess it wouldn't have applied to me much anyway. I was sort of my own thing. It was fun for me to just have some money in my pocket and be able to spend the evening and enjoy the lights and noises and people of the carnival. On this night, I had just finished filling myself with all sorts of terrible treats. Corn dogs, cotton candy, gallons of soda. I was eating an elephant ear as I walked past the rides. By this point, it was completely dark out, and the full lights of the fair were on. It was something else to see, and it was such a different atmosphere than I was used to. I used to think that this must be what it was like to walk through a city at night. I've since learned it's very different, of course. This was also happening back in the 1980s, when they were playing lots of 80s hairband music. Very loud, of course. I didn't want to go on any of the rides so soon after I'd stuffed myself, so I decided to just wander around to the carnival games. Perhaps there'd be something I wanted to play. There were, of course, lots of people who were there with their families and girlfriends and some such. It seemed like I was the only person there by myself. Like I said earlier, that's just how I liked it. It got the attention of someone at one of the booths, though, and I would have preferred it didn't. Hey, what's the matter, kid? Can't find a girl to take pity on you? I heard a voice say. I knew he was talking to me. I snapped back and looked. It was a guy who was running a dart booth. You know, one of those games where they have balloons and you gotta hit them with the darts to win a prize. He was just a hideous-looking person. He had dry, wrinkled, and scaly skin. Maybe only a few teeth left in his grin, obviously blackened by the tobacco he was chewing. I can't even do justice to how ugly this guy was, and yet for some reason he decided to just insult me. I mean, I knew he was just doing it to try and raise my ire and bluff me into playing the dark game. It was infuriating though. Why did he have to pick on me for no reason, especially talking down about my appearance? I was so annoyed I shot back at him. Looks like you know a lot more about girls taking pity on someone. The guy's face changed before snapping back to a smile. I could tell he was none too happy about my comment. Well, why don't you try your luck here? He asked. Most of the prizes were these small square mirrors that had pictures on them. Some were pictures of hard rock bands, some were cartoon characters. They also had some with pictures of scantily clad girls or equally scantily clad men on them. The guy at the booth picked up a mirror that had a guy wearing nothing but a thong. I bet you're just dying to have this one, huh? The man was irritating enough on his own, but I hated it even more when he made comments about guys being gay as if it was a bad thing. I went ahead and went up and gave the guy a dollar. He gave me three darts. It's been so long now that I don't really remember exactly how the game went, but I did win on the first three darts somehow. Then, just to piss this asshole off, I had him give me the mirror with the guy on it. His eyes grew wide and he paused, but he handed it over. I guess I was feeling like a real tough idiot that night, because just to piss him off even more, I took the mirror and licked the picture of the guy on it. You know, just to really get under his skin. 
He started calling me slurs and said some other things, but I simply walked off. I kept the mirror, thinking it would be a lovely gag gift for my sister. Of course, I stayed much later at the fair, though. It was closing down when I finally decided to go home. It was weird how dark the area got when the lights began going out. On the way out of the park, I had to go past the games once again. That area was completely pitch black because the games had closed down earlier than the rides. Even though the games were closed, that carny from the dart game was still there, leaning against his booth and staring at me while smoking a cigarette. Immediately, I looked away. I didn't think he'd followed me at first when I left the fairground and headed out to my car. It was a bit of a long hike. The parking lot was a pretty big field. There weren't really many people walking around now either. I tried to hurry to my car without making it seem like I was hurrying. I kept on feeling like I was being watched or followed. Even though, logically, to myself, I didn't have any reason to be feeling that way. I doubted some carny would be stupid enough to actually try to follow me and do something. If you've ever had that feeling, though, you'll know that sooner or later, you have to give in and look behind you. When I did, sure as hell I saw that nasty carny following me. Ah, oh, shit. This was all I needed. I'd seen way too many scary movies where a person is being followed and they pretend like they haven't noticed and walk slowly. I didn't care. I took off sprinting towards my car. I didn't look behind me again, but when I got to my car and turned to face the door so I could put my keys in, I saw the man had been running after me the entire time. I didn't even have enough time to get my keys out of my pocket and into the keyhole before the man tackled me to the ground. I fell hard on my ass, and the man punched me right in the nose. I coughed and spit out some blood. The man smiled his nasty, toothless grin at me and reached behind him. He pulled a knife out of the back of his belt. He took the knife and placed it up against my face, then traced it down to the crotch of my jeans and held it there, the point against my zipper. I tried like hell to push him off me, but I just couldn't. He had way too much leverage on me. Only girls should like dick. So I guess I'm just going to have to cut yours off, he said. I spit some blood out in his face and told him I wasn't really gay. I was just trying to piss him off, but he didn't seem to care now. The knife ripped through my jeans and my boxers and even caught a bit of my flesh. I screamed in pain. Finally, though, something good happened. Someone tackled that bitch right off of me. I didn't know who it was at the time. Some big jock guy wearing a leather jacket but he took that carnival freak down easily. It was quite fortunate for me. Although there were not a lot of people left in the park, it was also not completely empty. Several people also leaving had seen the freak chasing me, and lucky for me, one was this big friendly fellow, who I later learned was named Thad. The carny got arrested, and I went to the hospital for the wound on my crotch. Fortunately, it healed pretty well. Left a funny-looking scar as well, it's been a wonderful story to try and pick up women afterwards. I usually tell them, hey, you want to see something funny? Honestly, maybe not the best lead-in, but it works well enough. Oh well. Anyway, fortunately for me, I have no PTSD for fears or anything after. There's also not really any dramatic ending to the story. I went back to the fair next year like always. What else am I going to do in that town? I am, however, more careful about who I try to antagonize now. So I'm a huge fan of hiking, or simply taking walks in the woods as well. The only time I go alone is when I'm in the woods I live near. This day, I was not. I was with my friend Lars in a walk about three hours from my home. We were planning on traveling around and staying at motels in the meantime. That day, we decided to take a walk in a popular area for people who like to walk in the woods like me. Catch was, was that these woods were freaking huge. Not really bad for us, though. We were thrilled, actually. There wasn't very much to do there, although it was very pretty. We escaped the crowd, but every now and then we would still see someone walking by. We walked for a while, until we got to this spot not too different from the rest, except for one thing. Nobody else was around in this section. That's why Lars and I had taken this turn. The other one had quite a few people on it still. After a while of walking down this empty path, 
we were surprised when we spotted a man, a completely naked man. We gave each other a look and turned around immediately. The man was slightly off the path, seemingly bent over and looking at something. As Lars and I were walking back, talking about that strange man, I heard a voice call out from behind me. I turned to see the man. He was calling out to us about some bug he had just picked up. I got a real good look at him. He was a bit tall, though nothing crazy, bald with a few brown hairs growing out, completely naked though. I flashed the man a smile and started walking faster. We got out of the place as fast as we could. Once we got to the car, we actually kind of laughed at ourselves. Yeah, it was kind of weird, but actually it was weirdly funny thinking on it after. The car ride was nothing really to talk about, so skip back to the motel. As we're checking in, we see the man walk in. He was a bit hard to recognize, considering the fact that he now had clothes on, just a bit torn up. He waited behind us in line. Good thing we were almost done checking in, because as soon as we did, we went right to our room and locked it with no other thoughts. Now this was definitely creepy. Was he following us, or was it just a coincidence, and he happened to be staying at the same motel? We both decided we weren't going to stay for more than one night. Heck, I didn't even want to stay one night if it weren't for Lars telling me it would be fine. That night, Lars wanted to go out for a cigarette. I don't smoke myself, but no way was I going to stay in the room alone. I followed him outside and we chatted for a bit. After a few minutes though, I see that guy walk out of one of the doors. Lars put out his cigarette immediately and began to walk inside. Before we managed to get in, we saw the guy pull out a knife from his jacket. It was dark, so I couldn't really see. I did see he'd started carving through his sleeve, though, and right into his arm. I saw blood trickling to the ground. I rushed into the lobby. Lars got the same idea and followed. We alerted the staff, but by the time they got someone to come out and check, the man had completely disappeared. To this day, I have no idea what was going on with that man. Did he follow us? Why was he naked in the woods? And why did he just randomly start stabbing himself? I'll never know the answer, but honestly, I'm still spooked. I used to like Halloween quite a lot, actually, until I became a pizza delivery guy. This story actually happened a while back, before people began paying for pizza on the internet. Back then, it was much easier to play that idiotic prank where you order a pizza to a different person's home. I can't believe that stupid people actually think this is a funny thing to do. I mean, the only people it ever really hurts is the pizza delivery place, and they had nothing at all to do with the original conflict. In that vein, people really used to pull out the stops for this prank on Halloween. I was always dreading working that night because so many kids would call in false pizza orders. A couple of times, nearly one-third of all the deliveries that night would be jokes. On this particular Halloween, I had really been dreading going to work, but I was a sophomore in college and so I needed the money. The tips were more than ever something I really needed too. Despite my dread of wasted work, however, it turned out to be a relatively prank-free night. I worked from noon until close, which was about 11 p.m. I'd racked up a couple hundred dollars in tips. I was about to get off shift for the night when this last-minute delivery came in. My manager was just about to tell the caller that delivery hours were over and the caller would just have to come in and pick up their pizza themselves. Unfortunately for me, I was in such a good mood at how well the day had gone, I went ahead and agreed to just go and deliver that last pizza. On my way, as typical for a Halloween story I suppose, I noticed that this house was quite off the beaten path, out on a country road. It still was fine though, the ride was creepy enough, but it was fairly enjoyable. I drove my car onto the gravel road. There were many trees on either side, and they appeared to sort of reach over and grab onto the branches, making sort of an arc. The heavy falling of leaves had just begun, and the ground was completely covered in them. It was quite a bit of a ride getting out there, but it was really quite nice scenery. 
When I did finally notice a house on the way, it was sort of off to the right of the road. Very typical country-style house. A small black mailbox at the end of a small gravel driveway. It seemed to be a two-story house with a roofed front porch that had a screen door. On the top of the three steps that led to the porch was a traditional jack-o'-lantern. You know the kind I mean. The one with triangle eyes, a triangle nose, and the jagged four or five teeth wrapped up in a smile. I pulled into that driveway. I looked over the mailbox and confirmed that I was indeed at the right place. I hopped out of the car and heard the leaves crunching under my feet as I walked up to the porch. I saw there were only two lights around. One was the very dim light coming from what I assumed to be the living room, and the other was simply the jack-o'-lantern. I climbed up the stairs, and I noticed there was no doorbell, nor was there any way to knock on the door behind the screen door. I went ahead and opened it, and walked under the porch. It was extremely dark at this point, and I no longer had the light of the jack-o'-lantern in front of me to show me what was going on. Still, though, I made my way over to the door. I rang the doorbell. I waited there for a while, and no one came at first. I buzzed it again and took a few more tries before the door finally opened. Standing by the side of the door somewhat behind it was what I assumed to be an old lady. They were a very tall, thin person who was wrapped in a thick crocheted shawl around their chest, shoulders, and head. I could see very little of this person because it was so dark inside. Hey, uh, I got your pizza right here, I told her somewhat nervously. Uh, it'll be 11.29 if you please. The lady in the shawl nodded. Won't you come inside? She asked me. I really did not want to do so. I hated going into anyone's house for pizza delivery, and I really did not want to go into a house like this. Oh, uh, it's alright, take as much time as you need, I can wait here. I nervously informed her. Ah, oh, but my money is in the kitchen, won't you come in please? I really didn't want to go in there, but I thought if she was going to keep insisting that I do, I would never be able to get out of there. I started to walk into the house when the woman shut the door behind me. The old woman hobbled her way into the kitchen, and I followed nervously behind. It was hard to get a good look inside the house, because there was only a single dim lamp lit inside. It had one of those very thick lampshades that blocked out most of the light as well, so the light only shone on the ceiling and floor really. This house was old, and everything in it was old as well. It was like the most stereotypical old grandma house I had ever seen. It was so stereotypical I half expected the woman to have an old wedding cake left over from the wedding where she'd been jilted, and for her to start calling me Pip or something, but I digress. As I continued further, I started to notice the whole place had this kind of musty odor that made me feel very icky and unnerved. The woman walked into the kitchen, but she didn't turn on any lights. I kept a few feet from the kitchen doorway. Sure, I was already inside, but I didn't want to walk into the pitch black with a stranger. She disappeared completely from view. Then after a moment, I saw her shadowy outline appear in a doorway. She beckoned me forward. Won't you come in? She whispered. She stood in the doorway and I didn't move an inch. I could barely see any of her due to the shawl and the shadows caused by the darkness. She swayed a bit in the doorway, then repeated her whispering. Won't you come in? It was then that I noticed something. A tiny bit of light caught a glint of metal in her hand, right by her shawl. She had what looked to be a kitchen knife in her possession. I panicked a little bit and hoped she didn't notice that I had noticed. It was so dark in the house, though, that it was very unlikely she'd seen my eyes move over. She whispered once more, beckoning. Won't you come in? Well, I didn't want the money then. I knew my tips would be more than enough to cover the cost of this pizza. I dropped the pizza on the floor, backed up, and was about to leave. Unfortunately, I stumbled over a hidden bump in the carpet and fell down. In complete panic, I jumped up and started sprinting for the door. I peeked back like an idiot, only to see the lady had not moved. She was still in the doorway. I got the door open and ran out onto the porch. It was then that I heard another voice, this time a man's. Won't you come in? I looked over, only to see there, hidden away in the dark, a man sitting on the porch in a rocking chair. 
He was holding the jack-o'-lantern on his lap. He was looking at me with the creepiest smile. I had no idea how long he had been there, and I really didn't care now. I shoved open the screen door, sprinted to my car, got in, and drove off. I read a lot of these stories where people call the police after and they find out the house was abandoned or something. I didn't call the police, but I did tell my boss about it. He figured it was just a Halloween prank or something. I suppose he may have been right. They seemed a bit old for that, but who knows. That woman could have easily come after me when I'd fallen over like a dumbass, but she decided not to. Either way, I'll never go back there again. And I didn't mind the joke orders after so much anymore. I began babysitting at 13 years old to earn extra money to spend on horribly embarrassing things like Fallout Boy CDs and the like. I would almost always work for my dad's clients. He was a lawyer, and I'd get referred by word of mouth. I was babysitting for this one family who had a little girl who was 9 years old and a little boy who was 7. The parents seemed pretty okay, if a tad bit crotchety, giving me a full schedule to follow, and jokingly threatening to beat any boy who might mysteriously show up after they left. Honestly, it kind of felt a bit cruel for them to tease me about this, given I basically knew I looked like an overgrown baby with frizzy hair at that age. Almost immediately after the parents had left, the little girl started singing in this creepy, high-pitched voice, We're all alone now. Uh, rightio. Cue the Shining soundtrack. I know, the little boy chimed in. Let's play rape. Looking back now, I know the kid probably just heard the term on TV and knew the word was shocking. Said it just for a reaction, I suppose. At the time, though, it really startled me. I got all wide-eyed and tried to change the subject quickly. These kids were absolute hell for the next hour. They got real angry because I wouldn't let them watch South Park on TV. Didn't exactly seem like the thing their parents would allow their precious 7 and 9 year old to watch in the living room. As soon as I said no, the little girl said casually, Oh, that's fine, we'll just go play PlayStation in the living room. Feel free to stay by yourself out here. Well, I knew exactly where that was headed. I said they could watch anything else they wanted while I made them dinner. The parents had left instructions to make them sandwiches or something. I could handle that much at least. Before I'd even gotten out the bread though, I heard a massive crash. It seemed the little girl had broken a glass, whether in anger or on accident, I didn't really know. I was pissed and tutting along, but ultimately there was no way to punish her for something I hadn't actually seen. I cleaned it up while these two watched me with these weird eyes. Dumping the broken glass in the trash, I went back to making the food. I'm a vegetarian myself, so all the kids had chicken for theirs. I made a simple salad one for myself. Just as I was finishing up, the little boy screamed out in what sounded like a pantomime of pain. Nonetheless, I ran over to the couch in the living room to check on him. My ankle! He howled, dramatically flopping back onto the couch. While I tried to figure out just how he'd hurt his ankle, the little girl quietly slipped out of the room. I was aware of her walking around, but I didn't really pay it much mind. Instead, I was focused on this little boy, pretending to be in pain. He just kept on repeating, I went to Stan, but it hurt so much, I don't know what happened, over and over. I saw his eye suddenly flick to just behind me, where I could see the little girl now standing, with a very disturbing smile on her face. He was miraculously healed now. Yeah, praise the Lord, I suppose. At this point, I was simply thinking these kids were a bit weird. Maybe they craved attention a little too much and needed some more parental involvement. I was only 13. That wasn't my job. It was only $60 and four hours away. I set out the sandwiches for the two of them to eat at the dining table. I went to get us some soda and returned to have my own meal. After pouring soda for the both of them, I realized they hadn't eaten anything yet. I asked them what they were waiting for. 
They both gave me this very unnerving smile and said, For you to take a bite of yours. I'm so glad I had a gut feeling to open the top part of my bread for my sandwich. When I did, I saw a shard of glass, broken glass, the same glass that I just put in the trash from that girl's tantrum. I stared in horror at these two little kids staring at me with menacing grins. I lost it. Are you serious? At the very least, you could have really injured my mouth. What's wrong with you two? Instead of crying or apologizing or pretending to be ashamed or confused, these two little fuckers began to laugh, and not like a little kid laugh either. It was really low and kind of menacing, not a free laugh that kids would do. It was like they were threatening me. I'll never forget it. My immediate reaction was, these kids are way too young to be acting like this. I called my older sister and told her what happened. She came over and took over for me. We left the house with chills after the parents arrived, and I never babysat for those two ever again. What I just can't get past is the level of premeditation that went into sprinkling that broken glass into my sandwich, and the totally remorseless way they responded to me getting upset. All I can say is they were totally unlike any two kids I've ever met before. This happened a few days ago, and I'm still pretty shaken up about it. On Friday afternoon, I got a call from my friend named Sarah, asking if I wanted to meet her and another friend named Lisa at Dunkin' Donuts, as we hadn't seen each other in quite a while. The Dunkin' Donuts was a 15-minute walk away from my house, so I decided I would walk there instead of driving. Besides, the weather was very nice that day. I got there and found where Sarah and Lisa were sat, so I went to join them. As we were chatting and having fun, I noticed my sister Elena was sat at a table in the corner of the room with her friend Jess. I excused myself from the table and went over to them. My sister and her friend are both 18 years old for reference. My sister still lives with my parents, whereas I live alone. They were sat at a table with three seats, so I went to sit down and catch up with both of them. They both jumped up a little bit, but then looked more relieved than anything to see me. Immediately, Elena whispered to me, Don't look now, but the guy in the blue shirt over there? I think he's following Jess and I. I glanced over and saw a middle-aged man sat at a table facing away from us. He's passed our table a good five times in the past 20 minutes to go to the bathroom, but he always walks slower whenever he passes us by, she continued. I told them they were most likely just being paranoid. Surely there was nothing to worry about. For their peace of mind though, I offered to leave with them, so they wouldn't feel as worried. I walked back over to my table and explained the situation to Sarah and Lisa. Both of them laughed it off and assumed my sister to be paranoid. Literally only a minute later though, I saw the man get up from his seat and start walking towards the bathroom. My eyes followed him, and sure enough, he walked extremely slowly past Elena and Jess. In fact, it was almost comical how obvious he was. Both of them looked in my direction, and I nodded to show them that I had seen what he was doing. About five minutes later, I went into the toilets myself. On my way, I passed by them and whispered to them I was ready to leave whenever they were. They both agreed they were ready to go right now. I was just going to go to the bathroom real quick, and we could leave right after I'd done my business. Elena had come in her own car, so she was going to give me a lift back as well. I went into the toilet stall, did my business, washed my hands. I was walking down the corridor back into the main eating area, when both of them rushed to me. I asked them what was wrong, and they explained another man had joined that strange creeper, and both of them had been pointing and staring at them. They rightfully felt unsafe. We walked back to the eating area. I put my money on our table and explained to Lisa and Sarah that I was taking off. I would explain what was going on when I got home. We all piled into Elena's car and left that creep's car in the rear view mirror. After a two minute drive, we reached my house. Just then, I remembered I had been meaning to return something I had borrowed from my mother, so I asked her to drive me with them, since they were going there anyway. I jumped out of the car to get what I needed when my phone rang. It was Elena. 
she explained that car from those two men had driven past and pulled into a random driveway. The driver of the vehicle was for sure the creep from Dunkin' Donuts. I looked out my window. Sure enough, there was a car there which didn't belong to the owner of that house, parked right in their driveway. I ushered the girls into my own home and locked the door tight. I instructed Elena to take a photo of the car and its license plate, and I told Jess to call 911, as she gave the operator more information about the man than I could. Elena took the photos, and we sort of gathered around Jess as she was speaking to the operator. She had just finished telling the story. I heard the operator assure us the police would be at my house soon. A few minutes passed by, and there was a loud knock at the front door, followed by a voice shouting through it. It's the police! Open up! We all did a sigh of relief as I went to go open the door. Jess told the operator it seemed they had arrived, and then she hung up. I was just about to unlock it, when I had the thought to look through the peephole at the top of the door first. I peered through, only to see there was no police officer. It was that same guy. I froze in fear. I didn't know what to say. We didn't call the police! I managed to shout back to the man through the door. Elena and Jess were both confused as to why I just said this. We had a call, sir, the man shouted back. You have the wrong address. Go away, I yelled. I informed the girls it was that same creep at the door, not an officer. They were both extremely scared now, as was I. I was about to tell Jess to call the police again, until I heard the sirens coming around the corner. Sir, you have to let me in right now, the man shouted. I didn't answer this time. He was pounding desperately on the door, commanding for me to let him in. Eventually, it turned into begging and pleading. I heard the car pull up and some commotion outside. An actual police officer then knocked on the door. I let him in after checking the peephole first. The officers took the man into custody, while another officer took Elena and Jess into the dining room for some brief questioning. I called my parents and Jess called hers as well. Both were here extremely quickly once we told them everything that happened. The man was found with a kitchen knife on his person and some other weapons in his car as well. Who knows what could have happened if I hadn't looked through the peephole first. I'm a female, and when I was 16, I hung out mostly with a group of small friends. Toby was the gay one, John was a small guy who posed at being real macho, and there was a foreign exchange student from Spain named Maria. At the time, both John and I had a bit of a crush on Maria, since she was bisexual. This meant we both attempted to impress her any time an opportunity arose. This leads directly into the story. One night in October, we were all hanging out at Toby's house, smoking some weed like the fly little shits we were. Maria said that she wished she could do something scary, since Halloween was close by. It was also her first time in the States as well. Me, being the absolute coward that I am, loved the idea of doing scary things like ghost hunts and stuff, but actually doing them was a different thing entirely. Still though, I wanted to impress her with my bravery, or I suppose my stupidity, however you choose to look at it. I suggested going to this place called Spider Gates. It's an old cemetery in Leicester, Massachusetts that's a bit of a hike into the woods, and super old as well. It's also supposed to be really haunted. We drove the half hour in my dad's beat-up pathfinder down into the middle of nowhere until we came to the path that led deeper into the woods where this cemetery was. I parked right across the street from it. The car wouldn't even lock because it was so old and beat up, so we had to just leave it there and take the keys with us. We smoked a bowl or two on our way to the cemetery. Once we got there, we were stoned out of our minds. We walked around for a little while, and while the ambience was quite creepy, nothing really happened. We did hear some rustling occasionally and some stuff that was probably just animals or the wind blowing through the trees and making eerie howling sounds, but it was nothing out of the ordinary for such a place. We went to the part of the cemetery where the ground was raised up a bit, like you were standing on a small stage. There were trees surrounding it basically in a circle, and we smoked another bowl there together. 
We had been there for what must have been 20 minutes or so, just talking, smoking, and laughing about dumb stuff, when we heard these loud, heavy crunches through the leaves and twigs coming from deeper into the woods, the opposite direction we had come from. It didn't sound like an animal either. We all quieted down and looked over, but it stopped as we did so. We shrugged it off quick. Looking back, this was stupid even if it wasn't a person. The area we live in had some bears, so it could have been quite bad still. We went back to smoking. John and I attempted to pathetically flirt with Maria, while Toby flirted with John and it was generally just a good vibe. Maria stopped though and told us to look into the woods suddenly. Right where she was pointing, about 50 to 100 yards away, there was a light. Basically, it looked like someone was holding a flashlight pointed right at us. They were so far away though that it didn't seem the beam was reaching us. A few seconds later though, it went out and we could hear this really weird high-pitched hyena-like laughing. I'm talking some real crazed, maniacal clown laughing. What the fuck was that? We were miles away from any houses. Before anybody had the chance to say anything else, another light flashed on, this time closer, 50 or so yards to the left of the first one. We could hear sprinting through the woods from the direction of the first light when the second went out with the same creepy laughter. We communally decided to get the hell out of there and started pretty hastily back down the trail. It was an extremely dark night. The clouds were heavy set in front of the moon, so seeing anything besides what our cell phones illuminated in the night was basically impossible. A couple minutes down the path, we started to calm down a bit and discuss what was going on. After a few seconds of calm though, the heavy footsteps started up behind us in the leaves. We stopped and turned. About 50 feet behind us, only barely visible in the darkness, was the outline of something in the middle of the path. Honestly, I probably would have shit myself if I hadn't been so high. John, being the brave macho guy, stepped out in front and yelled at whatever it was to leave us alone. A light switched on, I'm assuming in the person's hand, and they didn't move. They just stood there holding the light and shining it down on us. John yelled at the person for another 30 seconds or so before they turned off the light and just started to walk away. All the while, that same crazy laughing started coming from far in the woods. We quickly made our way out of there and went back to the car. We got ready to drive as far away as we could, but when we turned the key, nothing. Not even a slow turnover. Nothing at all. John liked to think he knew something about cars, so we all got out while he looked under the hood. The two cables that connected the battery were hanging free, and the screws that attached them around the posts or terminals were missing. He didn't know if we could reconnect them without the screws, and honestly, I had no idea either. We decided to try and call for help, only to find there was now no cell service. What the hell were we supposed to do now? We were in the middle of the woods with a dead car and no way to contact anybody. Those creeps surely weren't far behind because we could still hear them laughing like hyenas playing a manhunt in the forest. Lucky for us, only a minute or so after, a car came down the road and seeing our hood up pulled to the side to see if we needed help. I was really happy to see it was two older women and not some maniacal laughing freak that was also in on it. We gladly accepted the ride from them to the nearest place with cell service and called my parents to come pick us up. Needless to say, they were sort of upset with us for going to the cemetery in the first place, since it was technically trespassing. Also, for abandoning the car there. Overall, they were just glad we were fine after getting in the car with strangers, however nice and innocent they seemed to be. The next day, my dad, Toby, and I went back to get the car. Weirdly, this time we both had cell service. I'm not sure what was going on out there. I'm just glad those two old women came by and offered a ride when they did. I'm not exactly sure if they were just having some twisted version of fun, or if they were out to do some actual harm, but I'm glad we didn't have to find out that night. Hey guys, before this first story gets started, I wanted to go ahead and let you know that there is some animal cruelty and animal death in this first story. 
So if you're not comfortable with that sort of thing, you can go ahead and take a look in the comments or the description below, and there will be a timestamp for you to skip ahead to the second story. So uh, go ahead and do that if you're not comfortable with that sort of thing. Uh, thanks for the understanding. When I was 16, I got my first job at a local fast food restaurant. Of course, since I was in school during the day, I had to work a second shift job. I was hoping that by working, I would be able to save up some money to buy my own car. Until then, however, I had to walk home to the restaurant when I got off work. It really wasn't that bad, since the restaurant was in the town I lived in anyway. The walk was maybe a little over half an hour or so. The only bad thing about it really was that I had to walk past this lightly wooded area that always gave me the creeps. It was pretty dark as well and not fenced off, which made it even freakier to me. Both of my parents worked early in the morning, and even if they didn't, they likely wouldn't have come to pick me up anyway, since it was such a short walk. One Friday night in the middle of summer, I had just gotten out of work. It was around midnight, since the store had closed at 11pm. I got everything cleaned up and began my walk home. It was a really nice night out actually as I was walking along the town street. The sky was extremely clear, and I found myself constantly looking up at the constellations. They were particularly bright tonight. I was looking forward to arriving home and taking a long shower, then maybe playing some video games before going to bed. I did begin to get a little apprehensive though, as I walked by that wooded area. It was right by a road that led away from the main town road, and off to a housing area that I lived in. It wasn't even that far to go, really. It bugged me, though, because there were no street lamps at all in that area. It got very dark very quickly, and I wouldn't get light again until I turned onto the next street where the houses were. I made the turn onto that dark, wooded street, and tried my best to pace myself as I walked along. Hurrying surely wasn't going to help me. For some reason, I found I always got a lot more frightened whenever I tried to run or hurry. Not sure why. I guess if someone saw me running, I would have been quite humiliated. 16-year-olds really shouldn't be so scared that they try to run down the street, though. That's what I told myself. It wasn't like anyone would have seen me anyway being so late at night. But for some reason right now, I still felt like I was being watched. Hey, kid! I heard a voice off to the side of me call out. I nearly jumped out of my skin. It took everything I had in me not to just take off running down the road. Turning around though, I looked and didn't see anyone there at all. All I could see was a bunch of wooded area and trees. As I was trying to look a bit closer, a man suddenly stepped out from behind one of them. I kid you not, he was dressed exactly like a ringmaster from a circus. He was wearing a black top hat and a red jacket with white pants on. He was very neat for having just been in the woods, and he had this big smile plastered across his face. Uh, hey there, I responded. I shuffled on my feet, not really knowing what to do. Come over here, kid, the man called to me. I want to show you something. I didn't really want to go anywhere near this guy. He didn't make any moves toward me, but he was really creepy. Uh, sorry, I'd best be on my way home now, I told him, and started to walk a little quicker down the street. Come on, kid, it'll only take a second. I want to show you something real cool. Now, I know that everyone reading this will just think it would have been stupid for me to not keep walking, but I'd never really been good at conflict, and I didn't know how to feel in awkward situations either. I motioned again I was just going to walk home. Once again, the man gestured for me to come to him, and indicated he really, really wanted to show me something. And against my better judgment, I found myself turning over towards the man. I figured if I just waited there, I could tell what he was up to without getting too close to him. He noticed that I had walked slightly towards him, and his already wide grin grew even wider. I didn't plan on going any further than this, though. Just close enough to see what it was he was supposedly trying to show me. I wanted to stay as far away as possible. I stopped a fair bit of the way across the street from the guy. Come on, kid, come closer. I need to show you something. I think you can show me from where I'm standing, I told him. I was being foolhardy, I admit, 
but I could still draw the line between foolhardy and completely dumb. The man looked very disappointed, but his smile only faltered a little bit. It didn't fade completely. All right, well, I suppose that's close enough. I'll go get it. The man walked back behind the tree line and was out of sight for a moment. I thought about just leaving while he was back there, but I just stood there, afraid to move. The man was only gone for a moment, but when he came back from behind the tree, he had something vile in his hand. It looked like he had sewn the top half of a dead chihuahua onto the bottom half of a fish, and he didn't do a good job at it either. It was covered in dried blood, and one of the dog's eyes was hanging out of its socket. The man smiled at me. I found a Fiji mermaid. I took off and ran my butt off. I didn't stop until I got home. Rather than save it for a car, I used my money to buy a bicycle so I could ride home instead. Back in the day, my parents didn't really have the money to buy me the dress I wanted to wear to homecoming, so I decided to get me a job as a babysitter in order to pay for it myself. It was a bit of a dicey thing to try and do, I suppose. I mean, nowadays, people are understandably cautious about having other people not only in their home, but also watching their children. I actually had to take to showing his parents my report cards and giving them recommendations from my teachers as well. I can understand it, especially after hearing all the horror stories out there, but understanding didn't make it any less frustrating. When I did finally land a job though, the people I found it with were very much the complete opposite of the parents I'd normally get. I had brought copies of my cards, all my recommendations, but they seemed genuinely surprised when I offered them up. Even more surprised than I was that they didn't ask for them. They almost seemed like they were trying to cover up for not asking, and feigned interest in seeing them after. I got the job pretty quickly. It was great, too, because it was a standing Friday job and paid extremely well. Because I'd gotten the job so easily, I automatically thought those kids must be real terrors or something. My own parents were fairly strict, but I know a lot of parents don't know how to raise their children right, and they become little terrors. Trust me, I've seen it happen many times. I was pretty nervous on my first night there. I was very pleasantly surprised to find the kids were absolute angels, possibly the most well-behaved kids I'd ever seen in my whole life. I was a bit confused then about why the parents had been like that, I wrote it off as maybe they were just more trusting than most others I'd interviewed with. A few weeks after I'd been initially hired, my friend Jody asked me if I wanted to go to a movie with her on a Friday night. I let her know I wouldn't be able to, because I had that babysitting job. She often babysat too, and asked me lots of questions about what the family was like, how well behaved the kids were, and of course what the job paid. As we were talking, I mentioned the name of the family I was sitting for, and Jody turned white as a sheet. For a girl who spent several nights a week in the tanning booth, this was saying quite a lot. She confirmed the address of the house I was working in, and she shook her head at me, telling me I sure was brave. When I asked her to explain what she meant, she told me the house was a bit of a hot potato in the neighborhood. In her own life, she'd seen over six families move in and out of it, and that was only when she was old enough to begin paying attention. She told me the reason why was because there was a family back in the 1960s that had owned the house. Supposedly, they had a 10-year-old girl, but they kept locked up in their shed in the backyard. She didn't go to school, didn't have any friends, they just left her out there in her own filth. She died of malnutrition at the age of 10. Let me be clear, I did not believe her story, and I don't believe it now either. To me, it was just one of those far-fetched urban legends people tell each other. Through the grapevine, they get more and more outrageous over time. Although I didn't believe that particular story, I did become a bit nervous about the house, though. I never brought this urban legend up to the parents because I really loved the job and didn't want to lose it by being weird. A couple weeks after Jody told me that story, I was babysitting that Friday night. You know, typical scary story setting, a babysitter on a dark and stormy night. Well, that was what was happening. 
I had put the kids to bed earlier, and it was about 10 p.m. The parents were out very late, and I didn't expect them to return home until close to 2. I was in the upstairs den watching The Daily Show when a large boom of thunder shook the house. As expected, soon after, the eight-year-old daughter rushed into the den. Aw, oh, honey, are you scared of the thunder? I asked her when she ran up to me. The girl, Ellen, shook her head, though. She said something I couldn't quite understand. When I asked her to repeat herself, I regretted it immediately. No, I'm scared of the girl in the backyard. Of course, I was immediately alarmed. I asked her what she was talking about. She told me to come with her, and she'd show me. I kept hoping to myself that she'd just had a bad dream or something. I was nervous as she led me to her room. She then told me to look out into the backyard. I was scared, of course, but I was the babysitter. This was the very essence of my job, to protect the children. I crept up to the window and peeked out. Of course, there was nothing there. Turning back to Alan, I began to ask her if she was sure she didn't just have a bad dream. Before she could answer, though, I saw something out of the very corner of my eye. My head snapped back to the backyard, and I'll never forget what I saw that night. I saw a girl wearing nothing but a nightgown, crawling across the yard and flopping in the mud. She crawled over to the shed, turned, looked up at the window, nudged the shed door open, went inside and disappeared. Terrified, I rushed the children into the den and called the police and the parents. They all came out immediately. The police searched the yard and the shed, too. They didn't find the girl. However, they did find mud on the door of the shed and strewn about the floor, as if it had been tracked in recently, so surely someone was in there. I didn't believe in ghosts then, and I still don't honestly to this day. I think it must have been a prank set up by my friend Jody, or perhaps a homeless person or something. She denies any involvement, and seemed genuinely terrified when I told her the story. None of the parents nor the police claim to have ever heard the urban legend when I told it to them, so I don't even think that's a real story in the first place. The fact is, I don't know what it was I saw that night. I have no explanation. Even if I did, it was scary as hell when it happened. When I was 17, I babysat for a house right on the outside of town. It wasn't a rural setting, one of those homes that's not on a block in a neighborhood though. It was set just off a local highway and was at the end of a good 50 yards or so driveway. The father of the family worked in pharmaceuticals and was really well off. We used to always joke he was only able to buy the house because he made so much drug money. Three years earlier, my parents drove me over until I was 16. At that point, I got a car. Fortunately, I had a lot of babysitting money from that job I had been saving up, specifically to grab one. I really enjoyed this job, which I guess is quite obvious, since I'd been with them for many years. I'd never run into any serious problems there. At worst, the kids would pick a few little fights with each other or things like that. During a Saturday night in the spring when I was 17, though, something very odd happened. It was raining and storming pretty hard, and I had put the youngest kids to bed already. The oldest boy, Bobby, was 13, and he was allowed to remain up a bit later. I had been watching television while Bobby was in the other room playing video games. I was startled when I suddenly heard a knock at the door. I got up, wondering who in the world would be there this late at night during a heavy storm. I went over to the door and peeked through the glass window on it. I saw a random man standing there. A car running with its lights on was right behind him. The man was dressed in all black and a heavy trench coat. With the lights of his car shining behind him, I could barely see any of his features. I asked the man if I could help him through the door. I clearly had no desire to open it up. He simply asked me if someone named Charlotte was there. Well, no one named Charlotte lived in this house, so I told him the truth. Oh, sorry, wrong house. He walked over to his car, hopped in, and drove slowly away. It was weird, but I didn't really think that much about it. I went back and started watching TV again. Nearly 45 minutes later, though, Bobby was looking out the front window when he noticed there was a car pulling into the driveway. I got up and went to take a peek. 
It parked with the lights shining up at the house, and a man in a black trench coat walked right up to the door and knocked on it. When I asked who it was, the exact same exchange happened as before. The man asked me if a Charlotte was home. I told him he'd already been here and asked me that question before. I told him no one named that lived here. Sorry, wrong house again. Look, can you help me out here and uh, help me figure out these directions? I seem to be very lost. I declined, telling him no offense, but I didn't want to open the door for a strange man. He asked again and tried being persistent for a little while, but eventually got the picture I was not going to open the door. He hopped into his car and slowly drove away again. I looked over at Bobby and commented about how weird it was. He looked absolutely terrified, though. I asked him what was wrong. He just told me not to answer the door if the guy came back and to call the police right away. The guy didn't come back. When Bobby's parents got home, I told them about what had happened, and I asked why Bobby had been so scared. They told me that before they met me, they had a babysitter named Blair who used to work for them. Blair had disappeared one night while she was babysitting the kids. Apparently, someone had pulled into the driveway. They had security cameras set up outside. Not surprising, as I mentioned these people have a lot of money. A man, seen wearing a trench coat, walked out and asked if Charlotte was there. Apparently, he had asked Blair to come out and help him with directions because he said he was lost. Blair did this, and the two of them walked out of view of the camera. And that was the last time anyone ever saw her. I don't know why a person who abducted a teenage girl would ever come back to the same house. That seems incredibly stupid to me. Bobby's father figured it must have been vanity or something. He was successful once in a rich person's house and wanted to try once again. I really have no idea, though. All I can tell you is I'm very thankful I did not decide to open that door. I used to babysit for this woman who, honestly, I always felt should have spent more time with her kids rather than hiring a babysitter. She had three children in all, two young boys and one girl, all with her ex-husband. The very fact that she was the one who got custody of them told me that no matter how bad she was, the husband had to be much worse. Just to be clear, by bad, I don't mean she abused her kids in any way because I never noticed any signs of that. She seemed to love them a lot, actually. She was just absent all the time. She would go out partying and drinking and come home all liquored up. Often, she wouldn't even come home at all and would sleep the night somewhere else, I suppose at one of her boyfriend's houses. My friends all wondered why I kept this job, but to me, it was pretty obvious. First, she paid me really well for what I did. Plus, it was already bad enough. The kids didn't have their mother or their father around them. I didn't want to abandon them also. They were really good kids. This story happened on one of the nights when the mom was out partying, and I knew it was going to be an all-nighter. At about 6 p.m., I heard a knock at the door. Going to it, I recognized the man who was there as their father. I'd never met the man myself, but I'd seen several pictures of him so I could be aware if he ever came over. He was not allowed to see the children without some sort of supervision from the courts. The man asked me if he could come in and see his children, which of course I declined. When he asked me where the mother was, I told him that wasn't his business and I was simply their babysitter. He kept on trying to convince me to let him in and I kept on declining. He even tried telling me he must be a better parent than her because at least he was trying to see his children while she was still out partying. I reminded him, though, that wasn't any of my business. Eventually, he gave up and left. I wasn't really too concerned, but I tried to get in touch with their mother anyway, just in case. Not too surprisingly, her cell phone went straight to voicemail, though. I tried not to think about it too much longer, and put it out of my mind for the moment. Normally, I would have put the kids to bed around 8.30 or so, but half an hour before then, a big storm rolled in. The kids were scared of the thunder, so I let them stay up and watch TV with me. The hub was doing a My Little Pony Friendship as Magic marathon, so we watched that together. At about 9 p.m., I saw car lights pull up in the driveway. At first, I assumed it was miraculously the mother getting home earlier, 
maybe her date had flaked out on her or something. That theory was immediately dispelled when the window beside the door busted in. The kid screamed and got up and ran to the far end of the room. Looking at the door, I could see a man holding a tire iron, which he must have used to smash the window. The window wasn't big enough for him to get inside, so he reached around and tried to grab the doorknob. I had to decide quickly whether to call the police or to try to keep him from getting inside. Thankfully, the oldest girl was smart enough to run for the phone and dialed the police for me. This meant I had to deal with the outraged father. The man was yelling all sorts of obscenities at me, screaming and calling me slurs, that if I didn't let him see his kids, he was going to gut me in front of them and worse. Of course, anyone with sanity would know that was not a winning argument. Thank God this house had a fireplace, because there I found a poker. I grabbed the poker, ran to the door, and slammed it down on the man's hand. Fortunately for me, it hurt him bad enough to pull his hand out immediately. He began to scream. Unfortunately, the poker was an old piece of crap and broke in half as soon as I hit him. In the storm, there could have been no way he would have seen that, though. While the man was still cursing at me, I heard police sirens begin in between the thunder. He must have heard them, too, because he took off running. He got into his car and left. The cops came to the house and pursued the father. They found his car parked outside of a bar. He went drinking after I fought him off. Needless to say, he was swiftly arrested. The police had a long talk with the mother as well, although I'm not really privy as to what that talk was about. Unfortunately, the family ended up moving, so I was not able to babysit those sweet children again. They gave me big hugs and told me they loved me before they moved, though. That meant the world to me. I did see the mother again, because I had to testify in a hearing, but the father, luckily, that horrid bastard, ended up going to jail for a while. This all started about a month ago, when a man started banging on my door at 6 o'clock at night, yelling for a mic to come out and see him, that he needed to get his cigarettes from the man. I told him he had the wrong house and to leave. There had never been a mic that lived in this house. The man got even more aggressive, calling me a liar and how he was going to come in and beat that skinny bitch I lived with. I tried to call the non-emergency police line because I'd never called 911 before. They didn't even pick up. Looking back, it seems kind of stupid, but it was instinct. After some more shouting, he eventually left. I called my father, who was across town, to come home and told him what was going on. He showed up soon after. He called 911 to file a report. The man came back, though, and started screaming at my father as well. The cops were called again and showed up an hour after the call. They couldn't find the man and told me to simply defend myself if it came to it. After that, I ended up staying with a friend for the night because I didn't feel safe at home. I can be a strong person, but I don't think I can do much against a drugged-out monster. What made the situation even scarier to me is that while I was going through my driveway camera photos to check after, it showed him walking up to my house hours before and circling around it, and I had no clue. I had really bad anxiety, so the next few days were filled with paranoia and stress. Finally, I managed to calm down somewhat and convince myself that would simply be the end of it. Come that weekend, my father went on a trip with his girlfriend, so I was left alone for a couple of days. I had just put on a scary movie. When I heard screaming again and a loud bang, I pulled up my camera to see the man was pacing back and forth on the sidewalk and had thrown over our trash can, again screaming for this mic. I called 911. They showed up within minutes this time and were able to stop him down the street. They told me there was nothing they could do though since he hadn't committed a crime yet. If he came back to call again and then they'll have more reason to hold him. Things were quiet for a few weeks after and again I believe that would be the end of it. That was until today. This morning my father and I got into an argument so I wanted to take a walk to clear my mind. I went across the street to a park and sat by a tree watching cars pass by every now and then. A beautiful morning with beautiful weather. All of a sudden, though, 
I noticed a truck slowly drive down the left side of the park and turn to the street my back was facing. The man inside waved as he passed by, so I did too, thinking it must be a man going to work or something. He pulled off onto the right side of the park, stopped, and made a U-turn to come back. Red flags instantly went off in my head, so I got up to start leaving. I looked back only to see the person had turned off their headlights and was now trailing me. I got to the front of my house and he slowed down. I got a better look at his face this time, and it looked just like the man who had been harassing me. From the physical characteristics to his signature baseball cap, he glared at me like I'd taken everything in his life away from him. I got to the door and tried to barge in. My father put the chain on in anger of me walking out, but I had to scream at him that I was being followed and to open the door. He opened it quickly, but by then the truck had shot down the street. I'm terrified to leave my own home. I don't have a car to get anywhere quickly. I have to bike everywhere. Even now, though, I'm scared to do that. I don't know who this man is or what his intentions are. When I was 10, my parents and I lived across the street from my grandmother. It was around 8.30 or 9 p.m. It had been dark for about 15 to 20 minutes. I told my mom I was going to quickly run across the street to my grandmother's house. Instead of going across the street, though, I walked over to a convenience store about six blocks away. On my way back, while devouring my Three Musketeers bar I had acquired at the store, I came upon an intersection. A car about a block away was going through the intersection as well. Out of nowhere, this person slammed on their brakes, squealed in reverse and whipped their car around, and then started gunning it right at me. At this point, it was pitch black. No one was out, so I took off running for my life. I cut between a house and hopped a fence and started down a random alley. I could see his bright headlights behind me. They seemingly slowed down as he tried to turn into this tight space. I dived down and hid behind two trash cans while this fucker creeped by at two miles an hour, obviously searching for me. He passed through and pulled out of the alley. I could hear his tires squealing. I was shaking and paralyzed with fear. I waited for 20 or 30 seconds to get my shit together. I stood up and made it less than 20 feet. When I saw his headlights returning to the alley once again, this time I was behind someone's detached garage. Looking around the corner of the garage, I could see the man had now emerged from his vehicle. I couldn't make out his face at all as it was covered. I could see his head was on a swivel, practically breaking his neck searching for me. He pulled back out of the alley after getting back into his car, and I hopped through every person's backyard for three blocks until I made it home. And the part that sucks as an adult is knowing how dangerous that situation is. I didn't tell my parents because I didn't want to get busted for lying. I feel really bad now though. Someone should have been notified. The authorities definitely should have been looking for this guy. My name is Janelle. I'm a 21-year-old French girl and a student in France. Tired of not finding true love, I decided to lose my virginity with my best friend. In them, I found a pretty fantastic sex friend with whom I got along wonderfully on all levels. For about three months. That was around the time they threw me aside because I'm still in love with my ex. I was so fragile at the time that I made my first suicide attempt. I went to the emergency room and then the mental hospital. For the smart amongst you out there, you'll probably have guessed that I was already in a depression for a few months after. Under treatments as well, with a strong penchant for alcohol on the side. To complete this auto-destruction mechanism, what better than reaching out on some dating apps? A few weeks after my release from the mental hospital... I matched up to make some new encounters and forget about my dear and ex-best friend. I always met guys at home for a first date because I have zero experience with this kind of thing, and that's what I did for all of my normal dates. 
On one fine day, it came a time when I matched with a guy who we'll call Matthew. Matthew was not the most beautiful and had more than a few extra pounds, but I'm not exactly Beyonce myself, so hey, why judge? I matched since we had similar tastes, especially his hobbies and the fact he liked to smoke weed. So I thought to myself, hey, perfect. Why not smoke some joints between having sex and doing our hobbies? He gave me some personal information like his address, his job, things going on in his life. He told me he'd just recently gotten fired. Work or no work though, I didn't really care. I simply explained to him that I was in quite a fragile state and I'd just come out of a mental clinic being very depressed. All for the purpose of making him understand that I might not be at my best. I also told him I was not looking for something very complicated. He assured me that was exactly what he was looking for as well, and he actually preferred to just be very cuddly. Perfect. After only one or two days of discussion, we agreed to set a date, a mojito party at my house, and he'd bring along some joints. When he arrived, he was even worse than in his photos. He was completely dirty and had extremely greasy hair and was wearing a stained t-shirt as well. The style of a teenager living with their mom, despite being at least 26 years old. I was far from wetting my panties, but I desperately needed some company. I offered to make him some drinks while I chose a film on television. Instead though, he ran into the kitchen to prepare two mojitos before joining me on the sofa. We talked a bit and he was not really that smart or interesting either. I downed my drink hoping to animate the party with that alone. After that, it was a three day blackout. According to our dear Matthew, I had that drink that we smoked while watching a film before going into the bedroom. I can vaguely remember being on the bed and seeing him dressed above me, looking at me before turning his heels and slamming the door. I remember my phone going off constantly. I was away from a work group appointment at the time, so my friends were worried and kept on calling me. They couldn't contact me the entire time, so they contacted my sister. None of them could get through. Eventually, they got so worried they rushed to my house and rang again and again. Still no answer, so they called the fireman who managed to open the bottom door, but not the door to my apartment. They kept on knocking, calling me, and eventually I ended up opening the door. The fireman concluded I was hungover and left while my friends helped me get dressed. They also thought I drank too much. They noticed, though, that my body was now covered with yellow betadine marks on my arms, legs, stomach, etc. They took my cat and took me back to one of their houses since I was in an almost comatose state. I was having trouble speaking. I looked almost completely elsewhere. I seemed to have a lot of trouble conceptualizing as well. The next day, my sister came to pick me up so I could stay with her for a few days. Everyone was convinced I'd just tried to kill myself with drugs and alcohol. At about that time though, I started having a pain in my private area, and a lot of blood loss as well. My sister took me to the hospital. I explained to them that I had to report I may have had unprotected sex while unconscious. I was advised to file a complaint, and I was redirected to the OB emergency. The next day, I finally snapped back to fully awake. My relatives could see it right away. I was much more lively, my remarks were more consistent. I got swabs done and a bunch of tests as well. Over the course of a week, I made a series of appointments for blood samples, urine samples, etc. I went on to file a complaint with the testimony of my friends, who met me at home and my sister who took care of me the entire time. After talking about it to people my age, older people, but especially medical staff and the police, the term organ trafficking was mentioned more than once. Apparently that guy Matthew was suspected of it. They think he must have chickened out because he actually liked me at the last minute or something. Despite my complaint, my bed full of betadine, my underwear torn off, and the blood on the doors of my apartment, which I'm not even sure how that got there, my attacker got nothing, and I'll never know what really happened during those three days. I'd like to point out that I did used to drink and smoke in addition to my treatment, and never before had I blacked out for an entire three days. I'm absolutely sure he put something in my drink.
So this happened on Saturday. I, 29 and female, live in a fairly decent neighborhood. Not exactly the best, but definitely not one usually thought of as super dangerous either. Actually, it wasn't even that late at night. It was only like 9.30 p.m., and it was summer as well. It had only been dark for at most an hour or so. I had left my friend, taking transport back home, and since my friend had left in a rush, there was something I wanted to do that I felt I might forget once I'd actually arrived home. Someone had tried to take my phone out of my hands a few months ago though, so I was waiting until I was in a safer place to take it out. I turned a corner, and there was literally one more block to my house. It was a pretty narrow street. This seemed to be as safe a place as any. I started to pull my phone out when suddenly someone stumbled toward me. His words were quite slurred, so I didn't quite get what he said at first. It was dark as well. After a moment, I understood he seemed to be telling me to give him my phone or my wallet or something. I stared, and despite the darkness, I could see something in his hand. It looked very much like a gun. It may have been fake, but still, I was terrified. For some reason, I looked around. Not so far away, walking toward me, was another woman. I screamed for help and ran away from the man, all while bracing myself for the pain just in case the gun was not fake. The woman yelled at me to stop running and come inside the building closest to us, and she ushered me in. There, after having a bit of a panic attack, the woman told me there had been another man hiding behind a car nearby that I didn't see because I was so fixated on the other guy's possible gun. I don't know exactly what that was about other than grabbing my phone, but still, there's a possibility I may have lost more than just my cell phone if I decided to stick around. I've been debating about whether to share this or not, but I finally decided it's been long enough for me to talk about this. This happened to me and my mom a few months ago, back in October. It happened in a very rural part of New Hampshire, like a side road on a side road type of neighborhood. It was pouring out, as it had been raining for pretty much the entirety of the day. My mom had just gotten back from down the street in my sister's car. I was on the couch in the living room, when I suddenly heard the doorbell ring. Our front door has a big glass pane on the front, so we could look out from the inside, and I guess people could look in from the outside as well. Through the window pane, I could see a man. I didn't really get a great look at him, as I didn't have my long-distance glasses on. The man, though, seemed to have noticed I'd seen him, and waved as if trying to be friendly. For the rest of this post, I'll refer to him as the Poncho Man. I got up and thought about opening the door to see what the man wanted, but I relented. I couldn't properly see who this was, and I didn't want to let a stranger into the house. Instead, I went down the hall to my parents' bedroom, where my mom was getting ready for work. She asked what was up, and I explained to her that a man in a poncho was waiting outside our door and seemed to want to talk to us. Instantly, she went as white as a ghost. Immediately, she stopped getting ready, closed and locked the bedroom door, and started checking the windows to make sure they were locked. I asked her what the hell was going on. My mom explained to me that as she was driving home earlier, she had actually seen the poncho man. He had just been standing there motionless in the rain, on the side of the main street. As soon as my mom turned down our road though, she saw him start to walk in the mirror, presumably to follow us. At the time, the encounter was weird, but she hadn't thought anything more of it. Why would someone be standing out there in the pouring rain on this random back road in the afternoon? It was like he was waiting for something. I started to panic as well. My mom called my aunt and asked what she should do. My aunt told her to call the police immediately, and so we did. We proceeded to pace around the bedroom, frantically looking out the windows to see if we could find the poncho man. From where the bedroom was angled though, it was impossible to look at the front porch and see if he was still there. After what felt like hours, we finally saw a police car pull up. We carefully unlocked the door and went down to let the officer in. We explained what we'd seen and he agreed to do a scan around the neighborhood. As he left though, I noticed there was something left on the doorknob. I took it off. It seemed to be a political ad for a candidate running for office. 
At first, I thought it was possible the poncho man was just campaigning for said candidate, but then I found a lot of holes in that story. It was pouring out now, so why would he go door to door in that weather? And why would he take such an obscure route in such an off-the-beaten-path neighborhood? The houses were very far apart, so you'd barely make a dent campaigning in this area. The timing didn't make sense either. Sure, me and my mom were home, but it was four in the afternoon. Most people would still be at work. Eventually, the officer returned. He found the guy down the road and questioned him. The man claimed to ID himself and claimed he was a political campaigner and was just knocking on doors for that reason. When probed further though, conveniently enough, the man claimed he'd left the last ads at our house. That makes the campaign story even more absurd. Our house was right in the middle of the street. It's not like we were the last on the block. So why would you go down that street if you hadn't brought enough for the whole thing? Even the officer pointed this out to the man and said it was unusual behavior. The man fled soon after. Although the officer was suspicious of him, there wasn't really anything he could do about it. There was no way to prove the man's intent. He told us to be very alert and not hesitate to call if the poncho man returned. Fast forward a few weeks. I started noticing the officer's car seemed to be permanently stationed just down the road from us. I got curious and asked my mom about it. She said there had been multiple break-ins into the houses down the road, and now the officer was doing a sort of sting operation. The poncho man encounter and the break-ins may be unrelated, but considering how the man acted, I have a sinking feeling they're connected. Thankfully, for the past few months, we've seen neither hide nor hair of the poncho man. We got a new doorbell system with a camera, and the police left the area where they were doing the sting. I hope that means this whole situation is over, and we're done with and never have to meet that man again. I'd like to share my little story. My childhood best friend Marie and I were around 12 or 11 years old at the time. Marie's family had their own campsite in a provincial park, about two hours from our hometown. We would spend the entire summer each year living in their camper out there. In this particular summer, I was able to go and stay with them for a week, and we were excited to spend our time adventuring around the forest. On the last night I was there, we decided we wanted to hurry down to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed. It was early evening at this point, still pretty bright out, but just beginning to lose the light. The path we took was down a short slope right next to the main road, with about 10 feet of thick brush and trees in between. On the other side was the forest, with more tall, thick brush as well. We were walking along, not seeing a single other person on the path in front of or behind us. All of a sudden, though, we heard a sudden rustling and snapping of branches, similar to the sound of a deer moving through the woods. I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but then the sound of running footsteps soon followed. Marie glanced back and suddenly grabbed my arm, urging me under her breath not to look. At the same time, the running stopped. I don't know why I didn't ignore her and get a look myself. I guess I could sense the very real fear in her voice and chose to simply listen to my friend. We both started to panic, getting that feeling like when you're running up the stairs after turning the basement lights off. We picked up the speed as much as we could without breaking into a sprint, knowing the ice cream shop was only a minute walk away at this point. The path soon broke, and we arrived in the parking lot. Suddenly, Marie steered me hard to the left, heading towards the lake and the boat rental area, instead of continuing straight to the ice cream shop. I went along with it silently, understanding ice cream was no longer the supreme interest right now. Marie was clearly panicking. We were both looking around, but it seemed whatever had scared her was nowhere to be seen at this point. Marie walked up to the boat rental and got us a kayak. We climbed in and paddled out into the middle of the lake. As we paddled there, she told me there had been a man behind us. The man had stopped running at us very abruptly upon making eye contact with her. He had been wearing a long black coat, with the hood pulled over his face, despite it being the middle of July. She'd seen a terrible smirk upon his face, and swore that as he stopped running, she saw him put away something shiny into his coat pocket. 
He appeared to have just emerged out of the bushes immediately after we walked past them, given the sounds we heard right before he came running onto the path. We reached the center of the lake and stopped paddling. I pulled out my Nokia brick phone that my parents had, thank God, given me just in case. I handed it to Marie and told her to call her parents to come pick us up. As the phone began to ring, I saw her look out past me into the shore. She went pale, lifting a hand to point shakily at what she was seeing. I turned. There was the man, stalking his way around the path that circled the edge of the lake, staring out at us, and watched him do two full laps around, never looking away from us. He waved before stepping back and disappearing into the woods. It took a few tries to get a hold of her family. We were freaking out so bad the whole time. As the sun got lower and lower, we did manage to have someone come with a truck. By the time we reached the shore, it was pretty dark outside. I don't really know what we would have done if I hadn't been able to call for a ride with my phone. Looking back, I don't know why we didn't just go to the ice cream shop, inform an adult there, and ask her parents to come get us then. But still, it worked out. We got back safe, and we thankfully never saw the man again. I was a utility locator, and I used to work on a team with my dad. To find a gas service from the gas main to the house, you must connect the equipment at the gas meter. Many older homes have the gas meter located in the basement. Sometimes, I would be the one to connect the equipment, while my dad went out to find the gas service. On this particular day, we got to a house that had the meter stationed in the basement. I go up, knock on the door, the homeowner points me in the direction of the stairs to the basement. I go down and I can see the gas meter in the corner, with two walls built around it, sort of making it like a closet with no door. Behind the gas meter was an old crawl space halfway up the cinder block wall, no lights at all in that space. As I stepped into this small closeted area, I heard what I could only describe as a demonic growl coming from behind the crawl space. I stepped out immediately and called my dad for backup. Not wanting to sound spooked myself, I only told him I needed a flashlight. He hung up and I stood outside the doorway and reached in to hook up the equipment. My dad came down the stairs with a flashlight. As he stepped through the door to see if I'd got it in the dark, that same demonic growl came from the crawl space. He just about knocked me down the stairs rushing to get back out of there. He handed me the flashlight and ran back outside. I stood there pointing it at the crawl space with a feeling that something was watching me. My dad called me and told me he was done working on this house now. I grabbed my equipment as quickly as possible and ran the fuck out of there. I never did find out what it was. I know for sure it didn't sound like a dog or a raccoon though, and I've never heard anything like that before or since. I had a veteran female marine in my anatomy class that was having some problems with what she assumed was a stalker. She had a guy from a town about 40 minutes away come to set up a computer for her and debug it. The guy was bragging about how he was all ex-military intelligence blah blah blah. She thought nothing of it at first. He got her computer set up and everything seemed to be fine. Mind you, she's a fairly attractive single woman and mother of four. Her house was huge and had a pretty good alarm system installed, including a motion sensor camera. The alarm system also gave her updated lists of which doors had been opened and at what time. She was home alone one morning, getting ready for class, when she heard what she thought was a door slamming. She grabbed one of her firearms and loaded it, and checked the house only to find nothing. She left and set the alarm, and didn't think much of it. Must be just going nuts from stress or something. She left the house, and then immediately got a notification on her phone that after she left, the alarm was deactivated, and the front door had been opened and closed. She realized she had not just been hearing things. She called the police and the alarm company, but after they came and searched the house, they found nothing. Fast forward a week later, alarm was still acting up. The cops had been called a second time, and her neighbor helped her search the house as well. She asked me while in class to come home with her and search her house with a gun. I agreed. 
On the way there, the alarm was still being weird. We arrived to the house and loaded our firearms. We started downstairs and worked our way slowly up. As we arrived to the top floor, I asked her if she'd ever checked the attic. She was surprised and said no. My adrenaline started pumping immediately as we found the crawlspace door up there. I climbed in first, not knowing what or who I'd find. We looked around with our flashlights and we could see a set of footprints in the billowing insulation leading to a far corner with a blind spot. We walked over cautiously to check. No one was there. We climbed down from the attic and shut the door. She recognized that sound as the sound she'd heard that first morning when she was home alone. We went downstairs to chill out and wait for her kids to get home when I noticed the doggy door on her back door. I asked her if she locked it. I inspected it, only to find that this lock could be unlocked very easily simply by sliding any key across the latch. The man had been entering and exiting her home through the dog door. We left immediately to go buy a new door and come back to install it. After leaving, she got an update that the doors from the garage into the house and out the back door had all been triggered in the meantime. They had been hiding in the garage the entire time while we were in the home. We installed a new door, and the problem ceased soon after. Scary shit. I'm not sure if this technically counts for the theme since my dad wasn't alone. My mom and I were asleep for this though and neither of us even knew it happened until he told us years later. Effectively, this means he was by himself in this situation. I've been itching to tell this story anyway, so here goes. This is more my dad's story than mine, obviously. I was really little at the time, and I don't really remember where we even were. My dad was driving us home from some trip one night, with my mom and I asleep in the back seat, as previously mentioned. We lived in Hemet, this kinda dinky town in Southern California at the time. We had to take what I'm pretty sure was Route 74 to get back there from wherever we were. Back then, pretty much nothing had been built out there yet, probably the mid to late 90s or so. It was just this big, long, lonely stretch of nothing out in the middle of the desert. It was around 1am or something like that, so obviously there weren't that many people out there, and my dad, being the only one awake, was already pretty on edge. Just up ahead, he noticed an intersection, and the lights began to change. He didn't see any cars coming at all, and it was just flat nighttime desert. You'd definitely see them if they were. For some reason, though, his hair began to stand on edge, as he puts it. Sure enough, as he looked a little bit closer, he could see someone walking out into the middle of the road. Already, he didn't like this one bit, but you know, maybe they were just lost or some shit, right? Out of his peripheral vision, though, he noticed other people hiding in the bushes on the side of the road. He pretty quickly realized these people were trying to surround his car. Some things about my dad. He's a mechanic, so he tends to acquire a lot of cars, and we had a lot of different ones through the years we lived there. He'd also been through a ton of shit. Alcoholism, drug abuse, a load of motorcycle accidents. He's got crushed discs in his neck and lower back but somehow he's still an extremely sharp guy. The car we had was a Lincoln Town Car, so a good 400-pound beast of a car. My dad knew nothing good could come from what was happening. He always liked to tell me that if you're in your car, that's the best weapon you can have. He just floored it. He hit the dude that had walked in front of the car. The dude went tumbling over the hood, and my dad just kept on driving. The next day at work, he started to think about it, and obviously he felt kind of bad. Maybe their car had just broken down or something and they were in the bushes for privacy. He didn't really know. He decided to mention it to a sheriff just in case. Maybe he knew someone who got hurt and didn't deserve it. Instead, the sheriff flipped out about it and started calling everyone looking for people who went to hospitals in the area with those injuries. It turned out there'd been a nasty string of carjackings in the area usually ending with the people in said cars being killed. My dad mentioned cars being found in the desert, burnt up with the people inside them still. 
I don't know if there's ever been any news on it or anything, so I can't really confirm that. Basically, the sheriff told my dad he did the right thing. Hammett was kind of a retirement town at the time, and Lincolns are kind of seen as old folks' cars, so there's a good chance these people thought my dad was some random old nice person, not a grizzled mechanic with his family sleeping in the back seat. Pretty chilling to think about what might have happened if my dad was the type to have stopped for them. Driving from North Carolina to Northern Virginia at night alone, typically about a three-hour drive, some terrifying shit can happen. This is 100% real, and I'll never forget that moment. I was a 22-year-old man at the time of this story four years ago. About halfway through, I needed to stop off at a rest station to very quickly take a piss. I remember wanting to be super fast, so I could meet my friends on time in Virginia. I pulled into a spot, and I saw another car pull in right next to mine. I remember thinking that they were parking pretty aggressively, but I didn't really look much more or think anything beyond that. Instead, I went to piss. As I was leaving the bathroom, I saw this guy meander in and lock eyes with me, in the fucking weirdest way I'd ever seen in my life. He had this black and white checkered shirt like a chessboard and neon green long pants. Quite a memorable outfit to say the least. As I passed him by, I expected him to go to the bathroom, but after maybe five seconds, he came out immediately walking after me. He hopped into his car, which of course was the one aggressively parked right next to mine. I was weirded out at this point, but surely now this would be all over. No. I drove for another 30 minutes, only to notice that a car had pulled up in the lane next to me and was driving at the exact same speed. I rolled down my window trying to see if this car was trying to tell me something. Maybe I had a tail light out or something. Keep in mind, I'd already long forgotten about that creep from before. Well, fuck me when I realized it was him, and he was not looking at the road at all. He was staring unblinkingly at me. He kept on making these faces, like he was gagging and smiling. He smiled like the Joker and kept licking his lips. It was terrifying. At this point, I flipped him off and sped up. This was also the exact instant when I saw his car lights behind me and realized that one of the headlights was out. In a startling moment, I realized that this same car had been behind me since I left North Carolina almost three hours ago. The man had been following me the entire time. With no clue what to do here, I couldn't pull over and I couldn't just drive like a lunatic either. In hindsight, maybe I should have called the cops. At the time, I didn't really know what to do though. I just sped up and tried to get him out of my line of sight. Eventually, I did manage to lose him a bit. Only for him to come flying down the road ten minutes later in front of me and turn his blinker on for the next exit. He slowed down, so I'd either have to take the exit too, or he'd try and force me off the road. I put my blinker on and waited for his car to approach mine. Then I floored it. And I mean really floored it. Close to 120 miles per hour. The man tried to move into my car only to shoot past and into the exit. And I never saw him again. It still haunts me that he was following me that entire time. If I hadn't been so quick in the bathroom... I wonder what would have happened to me. I was driving near Santa Monica College one day. It was a nice and sunny day with lots of people out on the street, hanging out, enjoying the weather. I was quite tired and more than a little distracted. I was stopped at a red light waiting for it to change. When my passenger door suddenly opened, a man got right into my car. I froze. This guy was in his late 20s or early 30s, tall and very strong looking, wearing jeans and a hoodie covering his face. He had a very angry look on his face. Drive, he said. I'm a woman and at the time I was 19. I was not exactly the biggest fighter. I was terrified. Every serial killer article I'd ever read flashed through my mind, and I tried to think of what I could use as a weapon, but there was nothing around me. All I could do was what he said. 
I didn't even get the chance to speak much. He had me drive him around Los Angeles for about two hours. Occasionally, he'd have me pull over to the side of the road and then just rant angrily to me about how fucked up his life was. All women are cunts and should be killed immediately. That was his main theme. Women suck and don't deserve to live. During those ragey monologues, he'd slam his fists into everything, kick the dashboard, and just go absolutely insane. I did what I think any person would do who's physically outmatched and trapped near an angry, crazy asshole. I acted submissive and unthreatening. I agreed with everything he said, so he wouldn't try to hurt me. Eventually, he wound down and gave me the great compliment of saying, I might be one of the few women who didn't deserve to be raped or killed. Then, just as soon as he'd come, at a random intersection, he had me stop. He jumped out of the car and ran away and disappeared. I was physically fucked up for days afterward. The adrenaline and the terror it kicked up was so strong, it felt like it actually crashed my brain. I had the freakiest walk home one night. So you get the picture, I grew up out in the country, smack dab in the middle of nowhere. Former farming community, but was mostly just people who wanted a bit of land at this point in time. When I was in my later teens, I would frequently walk home from a friend's house in the middle of the night. I never really thought much of it. It was a two mile walk in the middle of the night with nothing but the moon to light your way home. I was actually out with someone one night when they got a call saying someone had died or gotten sick or something or other. This person also happened to be my ride. They were going, they were supposed to be driving me home, but because of this emergency, he asked if he could drop me off from approximately where I'd usually walk from anyway. I said sure, even though it was slightly further and I wouldn't be going my usual route. Whatever, he had an emergency, so it was fine. I get out, my friend takes off, and I start walking. No more than two minutes into my walk, though, I hear rustling in the bushes, and something starts running towards me from the road. Another animal hops out of the bushes, doing the exact same. Two massive guard dogs, trained Dobermans. I instantly remembered why I never took this route. It was due to the fact that the people who owned this corner lot were extremely private. Gates and fences surrounding the property all over, with a massive home right in the center. Numerous rumors of nefarious activity surrounded this area. Anyway, I started running as fast as I could. I thought to myself, you fucking idiot, they're gonna catch you in no time. Instantly, I turned around. I made myself as big as possible, and let out as loud a roar as I could. I ran straight towards these dogs. Surprisingly, they took right off into the forest and presumably back home. I continued on my walk, thinking that would be it. All was fine and dandy, until I turned the corner, about 20 minutes from my home still. As soon as I turned this corner at the intersection, I could hear some voices outside. It was around 2am at this point, so this was fairly unusual for this area. I proceeded with caution and silence as I was growing closer and closer to these two voices. Suddenly, I could make out what they were doing. They were digging a fucking hole at 2 a.m. in the dark and freezing cold. I saw one of the men snap to attention. Hey, what was that? The digging stopped right away. I was 40 meters away from where they were digging. I did what any semi-rational person would do. I hid. I crept into the bushes and hid in the ditch for a good half hour. The men searched for a while before they gave up. I worked up the courage to sneak further into the forest and around so I could get the fuck out of there and into my bed. They returned to digging and talking the entire time. They didn't once mention what they were digging for, but I wouldn't either if I was digging a hole in the middle of nowhere to hide something. I got home and went right to sleep. It didn't sit right with me though, so I drove by slowly the next day during daylight to check it out. There was a hole that was freshly dug and filled in, right in the middle of the driveway. I kept my mouth shut about this for a long time. I didn't even tell my parents about it until a little over a year ago, when they were moving away from that area. 
Their response was to tell me about all the murders that had occurred previously on that street. My dad laughed and said, sounds like they added another one. <laughs> Good times, I guess. My dad is a very logical person, and I'd like to think I'd take after him myself. A lot of nighttime terrors I got through by calmly trying to understand what was going on and figuring out what was happening systematically. Those are branches from a tree outside my window, not hands tapping on the wall, etc. Our house was quite old and much of the support structure was made of wood, so I'd become quite accustomed to the occasional creak at night. Our house was also right next to a bend in the road, just along a speed bump, Often, this meant the car lights would shine in through the windows. Heavier vehicles passing on the road would even gently shake the house and cause some small creaks as well. For a lot of my childhood, I didn't have a door on my room. Not even a wall, really, since my room was defined by three walls and a closet serving as the fourth one. This meant that at night, I would often look out into the hallway of the house while trying to fall asleep. Every car that passed the bend in the road would trace their headlights across the hallway, accompanied with some minor squeaks and cracks from the road. When I was smaller, I used to get very scared of this. My dad got tired of me crying, though, so he laid in bed for about ten minutes with me to see what I was so scared of, then proceeded to systematically explain to me what was happening. Once I actually knew what was going on, I started being a lot less scared. One night, I saw some more lights, but these ones were moving a bit differently. Instead of coming out through the windows, it looked like they were coming from up the stairs. I saw a figure and a shaped cone of light slowly going down the stairs and moving down the hallway. At first, I thought it must be a very slow car illuminating someone out on a walk or something, but the lights normally stopped a meter or so from my door, and that's as far as the windows would allow them to go. The figure continued to move down, though, until now I could actually see it was a person, standing with one foot barely inside my room. It was a woman. She placed her hand on the wall. I could now see the woman standing there incredibly clearly. She was wearing some sort of dress and covered with a see-through drape kind of thing. It kind of almost reminded me of a wedding dress or something. I was stunned, staring at her as she stared in at me. I don't know for how long we were like this. It seemed she was just staring at me with her head tilted for almost an hour. Knowing the state I was in, though, it must have likely been about ten seconds or so. Just as suddenly as she'd come down the stairs, she turned around and sprinted down the hallway. For some reason, I just calmed right down immediately. Unnaturally, almost like shock, I felt as calm and relaxed as ever. I fell asleep and woke up some time later because my parents finally came home. I wanted to say something about it in the morning. I came downstairs to my parents yelling at my sister because she'd snuck out while she was supposed to be watching me. It turns out she'd left me home alone that entire night, so I have no idea who that woman was. When I was about 16 or so, I tried to get a good night's rest before a very important sectional track meet the next day. I was tossing and turning all night. Competition nerves and the heat radiating throughout the bedroom were keeping me wide awake. The windows were closed and the fan was turned off. All I could hear was the wind faintly slapping against the window from time to time. My door would typically be closed to eliminate the sounds that cornfield wildlife produced at night. At the time, my queen-sized bed was perfectly centered across the room from my two-swivel door closet. On the right side of the closet door hung some deer antlers that I'd found searching the cornfield mentioned before. It was probably around 2 a.m. at this time. The whole house remained silent, with complete darkness. Not a single ambient sound to be heard. As I was just staring up at the ceiling and walls, trying to follow its framing around the room to fall asleep, I heard a subtle, faint, scratching noise appear from my closet. My eyes shot directly to it, as my perception became slowly accustomed to the darkness in the room. 
I stared and started to sweat, concerned and trying to wrap my mind around what could have caused that sound. Again, a subtle scratching noise, almost inaudible. Likely due to the silence of the night, it caused me to really focus on anything that stimulated my hearing. I could not look away from the direction this scratching was coming from. I didn't see any changes in the closet door, though, as the scratching continued. About 15 seconds went by of just staring at this unchanging closet door. I was staring, holding my breath in terror, trying to decide what to do, when those scratches became bangs. Now I could visually see the door moving in and out of its framework, and I heard the rattling of the deer antlers clasping together on the wall. Whatever was inside my closet was banging on the door hard now. The bangs continued, and it felt like an eternity. I jumped five feet from my bed to the bedroom door to turn the doorknob and escape that terror. I sprinted down the hallway panicking. I managed to clear all ten steps that led to the main floor of my house in a single leap. I ran to get help, but when I returned, the noises had stopped. To this day, I have no idea what the sound was or what could have produced it. I checked the closet, but afterward I didn't find anything. I tell my friends this story sometimes, and they have no logical answers either. It remains a mystery I'll probably never solve in my entire life. I'm a 28-year-old woman, and this happened to me when I was 13 years old. I'm an adult now, and I'm still kind of traumatized, to be honest with you. For a little bit of context, at 13, I transferred schools due to a lack of money. The school I went to was a cheaper private school, because where I lived, the public ones really sucked. I didn't have any friends for at least the first couple of months, and I started noticing this boy, Victor. He was always staring at me during classes, in the hallways by the window. He'd stare at me at lunch as well. It was a pretty everyday thing. I didn't really care though. I was at an age when I only thought about stupid kid stuff like dolls or whatever. Oh, one more thing. I was flat as a table back then, so I looked like a really small child. The girls in my class started saying that Victor must have a crush on me. That creeped me out obviously because he was 18 years old. Still though, I didn't really think much about it as long as he didn't try to approach me or anything. Things escalated quickly, however. Victor started to follow me home every day. Thank God I moved since then, and he doesn't know where I live anymore. The most annoying thing he'd do, however, was that he'd constantly ask his friends to try and talk to me and try to convince me to go out with him and make out with him after school. These talks would usually take about 30 minutes of them trying extremely hard to convince me to go along with this. Victor would be behind them watching the conversation like some kind of freak. Obviously, I rejected him every time. Being the nice guy that he said he was, though, he spread rumors about us making out anyway. Nobody believed him because he was such a weird guy. The whole school knew about the events. The final straw, though, was when our school had to take a trip to a book fair. I was super excited. At this point, I had made a couple of friends of my own. On our way to this fair, I was on the bus with my friend. Victor was about three seats behind us. I could feel his eyes boring into my back the entire way there. Out of nowhere, he came and asked for my friend's cell phone because he needed to call someone. She handed it over to him, thinking he was telling the truth. How stupid of her. He returned her cell phone not even two minutes later. She checked to see if he'd done anything and showed me that he'd secretly taken a bunch of photos of me. I guess this was his way of saying that he'd already done this at some point before. She got extremely pissed and went to go confront him. When she returned, she looked extremely scared and said the creepiest thing I've ever heard in my life. She told me that he'd cornered her and said that for confronting her, that when she least expected it, he'd push her into a bathroom and rear her. Today, the only thing that went through my mind was, what should I do now? I peeked over at him and he gave me this creepy smile. After this, I went the whole day looking behind my back, not leaving the side of my teacher or my friend. 
she didn't understand why I didn't want to walk around and explore at the fair. I was in alert mode the whole time, though. Thank God nothing bad happened. When I came home, I cried in my room like a baby. This was at the end of the year, and thankfully I switched schools soon after. I told my mom this, and she told me, Yeah, that stuff happens. It happened to me too when I was your age. I was so shocked about how this was such a seemingly common thing. I'm 28 now, and I still see Victor out on the streets. He's even followed me around a few times. I always walk in circles until I lose him, but sometimes he tries to wait for me outside stores or restaurants. I think about what would have happened to me in the book fair if I didn't have my teacher next to me the whole time. I wonder if one day he'll try to do something, or he'll just keep up this creepy behavior. My girlfriend's mother is a longtime heroin user and has been in and out of jail for my girlfriend's entire life. When she lived with her mother and her mother's husband, she witnessed physical abuse and drug activity often. She was forced to move out at a young age just in order to stay alive. She thought her mother was finally clean when her mother announced a new pregnancy. After getting over the initial shock, my girlfriend decided to try and be supportive of her mother since she thought she was clean. That was until she overdosed while pregnant. At that point, she decided to cut all contact. My girlfriend is also a mandated reporter, and last year reported her mother and her mother's husband to the state, since she knew it was not a safe situation for the baby. Unfortunately, the baby died in their house not even a month after birth, due to an overdose with signs of physical abuse. Her mother was arrested for the murder of the baby and other charges as well. Her husband was arrested for child endangerment and other charges very recently. At first, the judge did not grant either of them bail. Eventually, though, her husband was granted bail, which he posted. We didn't know this until recently, which helped us put some of the pieces together. My girlfriend and I like to sit outside her house in the car and just chat and listen to music and relax together. Recently, though, there have been some weird black cars orbiting my girlfriend's house. We've also been frequently followed by black cars when we drive around. It's the same couple of cars that do this as well, not just random ones. At first, we thought maybe we were just paranoid. Everyone was supposed to still be in jail. Then, though, we found out the husband had been let out, and we began to doubt it was really insanity. The first major thing happened after my girlfriend and I had gone on a dinner date. We went home after dark and sat in her car for about 45 minutes when we noticed that black car passing us by every few minutes. After 10 minutes of passing us by, a different car drove towards us, flicking its high beams on just when it got close enough for us to see who was inside. It swerved into the oncoming lane and I genuinely thought it was going to slam into the passenger side of our car. It sped away and we ran inside. After that, we started noticing these black cars more and more. This past Wednesday morning and around 3 a.m. ish. That same distinct black van we'd been seeing pulled up outside my house. This was weird because my girlfriend and I live about 30 minutes away from each other in two separate cities. A man got out of the van and began shining a flashlight into my windows, scanning it almost. He shined the flashlight up to the window I was sitting at and kept it there for a moment. He walked 30 feet to an empty driveway, scanned everything for 20 seconds, then jumped back in the van and sped away. The windows were ice covered and frozen, so I couldn't make out the specifics of who was in the van. It was quite strange though, obviously. A few nights later, my girlfriend and I spent some time hanging out in the car when we spotted a black van once again hiding behind another car parked further up the street. We could only see one headlight. It creeped by us as we sat in the car and tried to hide. My girlfriend lives between two dead-end streets. Think of a very blocky U. The van went up the first dead end, four ways on, and sat for a few minutes before turning around and driving almost into the other lane of traffic just to get close to us. It then went up the other dead end and stayed put. We thought it was weird that the van didn't just back out at the first one, instead opting to drive all the way up the narrow street and turn around. 
After a few minutes, we called a friend and recounted the story just to get an extra opinion. While my girlfriend was talking, I got out of the car for a moment to light a cigarette and see how far away the van was now. I was simply walking for about 15 feet before I got the worst gut feeling I've ever gotten in my life. I could see across the street from me, hidden in an area with no lighting, was a black mass much darker than the darkness around it. I assumed this must be the van. I decided to turn around and rush my girlfriend into the house. Later that night, we heard a bang coming from downstairs, followed by what sounded like a boot rushing up the wooden stairs. We locked the bedroom door, and I sat against the door with a baseball bat, hopeful that would be enough to barricade it. A few minutes later, we heard a car door slam, before the sound of tires squealing and a car driving away. It was so surreal we thought maybe it came from the TV, but we realized we had paused it, and the TV in the next room was never loud enough to feel this real. I went downstairs an hour later to get water. There was nothing damaged or missing. We theorized that maybe they'd been trying to open the front door, but it was dead bolted so they couldn't actually get in. My girlfriend's exterior wall doesn't face the road, and we'd never heard car sounds before. The next day, I was shoveling the sidewalks at my girlfriend's house when I saw the same black car with mud streaks on the tailgate. It circled the block around me about four times. I was able to see the silhouette of the man driving to the passenger side window. Each time, it was the same person in the same truck. My girlfriend lives in a small town, and we were able to catalog the entire neighborhood's worth of cars. The black van and the truck were nowhere to be found, though. Our theory is that someone is trying to scare my girlfriend into not further testifying, or flat out make sure neither of us has the ability anymore. We really just need more opinions. What do we do in this situation? Do you think it could just be a series of weird coincidences? I, 29 and female, grew up in a nice suburban neighborhood. I lived in the same house my entire childhood and only left once when I moved out as an adult. I always felt safe leaving our doors unlocked, windows open, going out for late night walks as a teen. When I was around 17 though, I noticed some strange things started happening around my house. My house was also supposedly haunted so there were often weird noises and moving things on their own. It wasn't a new thing. This is probably why I dismissed my own experiences for so long. As a teen, I worked at a movie theater, and I did not work until the afternoon. I would get off at very late at night because of this. I turned into quite the night owl, and it was normal for me to stay awake until about 3 o'clock in the morning. It started off as my dog reacting to things outside. I would peek out my window to see what was going on and never actually see anything, so I assumed my dog must just be hearing noises and overreacting to someone passing by or something. Not too long after this started though, I went outside and noticed there were handprints and a mark between them on my window, as if someone had been pressing their forehead against the glass. I didn't really know what to think of this. I had plenty of friends coming in and out of my house, and they would knock on my window sometimes as they arrived. My window was right by the driveway as you walked to the front door. This window was also very large as well. It started about three feet from the ground and went at least eight feet high and four feet wide. The window and forehead marks were about six foot five height. I definitely didn't have any friends who were that tall though, and everyone in my family was less than five foot six. Soon after that, I woke up around 5 in the morning to my car alarm going off. Again, I kind of dismissed the situation and my grogginess. This happened a few more times within the next few weeks though, always about 4 to 5 in the morning, and I began to get slowly more suspicious. The last time, I noticed handprints on top of my car, as if someone had tried to crawl in through my open sunroof or something. After that, I started making sure to close all my windows and lock every door. This time, I thought maybe it was some hoodlums trying to steal something since everything had been open. Not long after the car incident, though, things started to escalate. One morning, as I was leaving to school, I found a small stepladder outside my window leaning against the house, 
as if someone had been looking through my window during the night. I had blinds that would move from top to bottom. Normally, I had the blinds closed on the bottom and left about two feet open on the top to allow sunlight in but still have privacy. When I looked at my window, I could see handprints and a forehead mark placed right above the opening of my blinds. Obviously, they'd been using the stepladder to peek in and get a good look of my room. With this ladder against my window, I pieced together the events over the past few months and realized I had myself a peeping Tom. I brought this up to my parents, but they did not seem to worry at all. In fact, they made no effort at all to do anything about it. Over the next year, I found the ladder against my window many more times. This person was using an old stepladder we had in the side yard that was unlocked. I would continuously put it back in the side yard, but it would always show up next to my window in the morning. Now, I don't know why I didn't just put the stepladder in a place that was not accessible. To be honest, I was smoking quite a lot of weed at this time, and I was not really using my critical thinking very much. Two other sisters lived with us, but they didn't seem to notice anything weird happening. It only seemed to be happening to me. About a year after I noticed the occurrences, though, we found my sister's bra out in the yard. We didn't have any explanation for this. At this point, I realized that somebody may actually be trying to get into the house when we were gone. With some success now, I became extremely paranoid. We would often hear male voices outside our front doors, but my family attributed this to the house being haunted. My sisters and I were often home alone, and when these unexplained voices happened, we would just go to our room to turn on some Spongebob and try our best to ignore it. Again, my parents were aware of all of this, but they didn't care to do anything about it, I guess because they assumed it was just a ghost or something. The last incident before we called the police was just after a rainy night. We found bare footprints outside my sister's window in the mud. The screen had been fiddled with, as if somebody was trying to get it off the window and get inside. Once this happened, my parents started to take it a lot more seriously. It's kind of funny in a way. They didn't really care when the things were happening to me, but the moment my sister had an experience, well, it's time to report it. The police couldn't do anything about it, though. They offered to send an officer every once in a while to fill out their paperwork in front of our house to make it seem like there was a constant police presence. This only happened one time, though, and they never came back. Afterward, my older sister made her boyfriend aware of the situation, so they'd help and sit in the car all night and watch for this pervert to show up. Every time he would try and pull an all-nighter to catch this person, no one would arrive. Looking back now, it makes me think someone very close to my house must have been the peeping Tom. He must have been close enough to see we had another person watching out for us. After a few years of these experiences, my sisters and I all moved out, and we've not experienced anything weird ever since. It still bothers me knowing this person was never caught, and we still have no idea who it was. It frustrates me knowing it could be a next-door neighbor who we thought was normal, but was actually a pervert or something. This was all happening in the mid-2010s, and was before we had easy, affordable access to security cameras, such as Ring and Blink and such. I wish we had cameras at that time so we could know who this person was, but I guess there's no point in dwelling in the past. I will always have security cameras around my house, especially if I have young daughters. When I was a teenager in the 1970s, I had the coolest bedroom. The room was sort of a dormer design with the ceiling slanted downward, great for hanging some psychedelic posters. The bedroom had crawl spaces attached as well, great for stashing stuff when I was older. Best of all was the window that opened to the garage roof, easy to scramble out there without the parents knowing. Anyway, a couple of strange things happened to me in that bedroom, when I was 13 or 14 years old. In this series of strange events, the creepiest thing happened to me one night in the spring, when I was reading in bed at around 8 o'clock at night. I had the window open, and the bedroom door closed. The rest of the family was home. I could hear them downstairs watching Happy Days together or something. As a teenager, though, I was way too cool for that, which is why I was in my bedroom doing some really cool reading. 
All of a sudden, though, I heard something big moving around on the garage roof. The bed was right under the window, so I could hear it very plainly. I couldn't see anything because of the angle, though. That anything would be on the roof at all was a big shock to me. There weren't any trees anywhere close by, and the house had an aluminum siding as well. It's not like a cat could just climb up the side or something. I was thinking maybe a big bird landed on the garage roof, perhaps an owl or something. It was a bit strange at that time of night, though. Then it got real scary. I could faintly make out that whatever was out there was starting to breathe really heavily. As the breathing got closer and closer to the window, it started to sound more and more like a person. I could hear the breathing getting louder as they approached close to the opening. It got closer and closer. The breathing was so loud now. I was frozen in terror, huddled in the corner of my bed underneath that window. I wanted to leap up and run down the stairs, but I was paralyzed in fear. Whatever was out there was only a few feet away from my face now. I imagined them looking in through the window at me. Even though I could hear my family watching TV downstairs, I was so scared I was holding my breath trying not to make a single noise. After a minute or two, during which I felt like there were eyes piercing me with their gaze, whatever it was started moving away from the window. I could hear the heavy breathing getting fainter in the night. And once I could barely hear the thing, still too scared to move, I started screaming bloody murder. My two brothers came running up the stairs to see what was wrong. I told them something was out on the roof. They rushed out to take a look, only to tell me I was full of shit and to quit wasting their time. Then they rushed back downstairs to watch TV. I closed and locked the window, shut the blinds, and moved my bed to the other side of the room. The next morning, in the light of the day, I went to check, but I didn't see anything out of ordinary on the garage roof. Needless to say, it was months before I dared to open that window again. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here as always. It's been a while since my last outro, so I figured I'd do one again. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, or subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any constructive criticism you'd like to share with me, be sure to leave it in the comments below. Although I can't respond to every comment I get nowadays anymore, I still do read all of them and I enjoy hearing your guys' thoughts and opinions, especially of your opinions on the stories in the videos. If you guys have some stories you'd like to share yourselves, please be sure to check in the description below the video. There will be links to all of my social media including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Be sure to send me a message on any of those and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has a type, and how you'd like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. Also, please be sure to properly format and add as much detail as you feel comfortable with to ensure the most probability your story makes it into a video. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for now, though. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.